Okay, thanks. Yeah, I'm thrilled tonight to introduce Sean Enns as our speaker. You have to eat the microwave. Oh, yeah, okay. Not there. Get your dessert for me. Right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sean Enns, he grew up in Shemanis in the 70s and 80s and met Charlie Abbott on several occasions. Today, he's a writer of fiction, nonfiction, and theater with a particular interest in stories, faith, and myth, legend, and lore. He's one of the leading historians on the history of beer and brewers of early Nanaimo, and has been speaking about BC craft brewing history for over five years. Now I've been featured in the Nanaimo Bulletin and on Shaw Cable's The Show, which you can still link to. Great. Yeah? Yeah. Both of them. Gotcha. His current projects include a history of local beer, a series of plays about neurodivergence, I have to look that up, and curiously, also a book about sandwiches. So um, I don't know what you pack in your lunchbox, but I guess I'll have to buy the book. <laughs> a barley sandwich. Yeah. So with that, I'm pleased to introduce Sean and turn it over to him. I'm all nice up here. Okay. Yep. Everyone hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yep. Fantastic. All right. Thank you, everyone, for having uh, me tonight. Really excited to be here uh, to debut this presentation. Uh, before I get into it too much, this came about, I think, I don't know exactly how long ago it was, but it feels like about five years ago, I decided to do a little story about Charlie uh, Abbott, the Shemanus Hermit. As Daryl said, I grew up in Shemanus. So I started looking around to see who had written something. Turns out Daryl had, so uh, I got in touch with him and we had a little chat about it and that sent me down a rabbit hole even further. Uh, and uh, yeah, I had built mostly a full picture of Charlie's life. Uh, and then last year, uh, Daryl emailed me and said, hey, did you ever finish that piece? Uh, do anything with it? And I said, not yet. And he said, well, come tell it to the Historical Society. And here we are. Uh, so I've titled this A Conversation with Charlie, the story of the Shemanus Hermit. This is part one, Charlie, the boy. So uh, Charles William Abbott, born in 1901 in Victoria to John Mark Abbott and Ada Watkins. Uh, he had three siblings, John, oh, I'm not going to say that, Fernie Bow. Abbott, uh, Mark, and Ada Wilkins Abbott. So three siblings, that's a picture of Charlie walking through the woods. That's really kind of the, the ultimate Charlie picture, the penultimate one. It's the one pictured in murals and, and most often seen in papers. It's Charlie with his back turned, uh, pushing a wheelbarrow. In 1915, so we don't know much about uh, what Charlie did, although ostensibly he was just a boy and did boyhood things. In 1915, Charlie enlisted in the service uh, to go to World War II. Uh, well, in June of 1916, so at barely 15 years old, he enlisted. Uh, he was put into Victoria's 51st Highlander Division uh, and then was uh, transferred over to the Bugle Band in the 102nd Battalion of the Canadian Expeditionary Force. Uh, pictured here is uh, Charlie Abbott, about five five foot five and 115 pounds soaking wet. Uh, so if you look at some of the information out there, uh, there are people that say Charlie lied about his age, uh, that when you get into the weeds, that's probably not true. It's more likely that he was allowed to serve as a non-combatant. Many boys did uh, back in World War I. Uh, and the boy soldiers, they weren't asked to fight on the front lines. They served as buglers or runners. Uh, dashing through the trenches to deliver messages to offer officers and forward operating areas. So that's a nice picture of Charlie there. Uh, so in 1916, uh, June 18th, Charlie's battalion was deployed overseas on the CPR steamship Empress of Britain along with nearly 6,000 other troops. Uh, they arrived in Liverpool on June 28th for six weeks of musket and bayonet training. Uh, and he never actually got deployed. So in the weeks before they sent his unit to the front, uh, Charlie, along with many others, was declared medically unfit. He was transferred back to the 51st 
Uh, and then to the Canadian Casualty Assembly Centre in Folkestone, and finally to the Canadian Discharge Depot in Bath uh, before returning home just a few months later on September 8th. Um, so all that trouble, and he never served a day. His father, uh, who there's some contention about, uh, so one of the things that was asked was who signed off on Charlie being deployed overseas? Well, nobody knows, probably his mother, uh, because she was quite ill at the time. Uh, his father did not sign off, nor did his father serve. Uh, he was a constable in the Victoria Police Force at the time, uh, though, of the sinking of the British ocean liner Lusitania, uh, which uh, an act responsible for the deaths of more than a thousand Canadians, including a Dunsmuir. Uh, which led to the anti-German riots of uh, 1915. That was in Victoria. And there's a really, I mean, this isn't a story about Charlie's father, but I think it, it tells us a little bit about Charlie. So uh, on May 9th, during the riots, John was drunk. Uh, so uh, he did have struggles with alcohol frequently. Uh, and so he was drunk on duty. He uh, was reported for that and summoned to the station. On returning to the station, he was dressed down by his commanding officer. Uh, and then uh, Abbott retorted, uh, swore at him, followed his threat to kill him, pulled his gun, uh, pushed the muzzle against the deputy's body, and pulled the trigger four times. Uh, thankfully, the gun was filled with blanks and nobody died. But uh, for his crime of attempted murder, John was sentenced to serve two years in Ocala prison. Uh, and after that, he did not return home. Uh, it's said that he chose to seek work uh, as a laborer and ostensibly a gardener in the United States. Uh, there is a mention out there uh, that John, uh, Charlie's father, was a master gardener, so it's possible. There's no evidence of this, but it's possible that he left, uh, after he left, uh, he went and uh, designed gardens all over the place, uh, that he may have had a talent for it. Um, so, uh, Charlie's mother ill, uh, Charlie's mother was quite ill and was unable to really care for her children. Uh, his father was gone. Uh, Charlie, more or less, uh, at that point, struck out on his own. Charlie the man. So we pick up with Charlie again in 1916, uh, and he started working as a laborer and gardener. Uh, there is a legend among the Shamanist historians that Charlie went to England, had an affair, sired a child, married a woman, uh, worked at uh, the Hatley Estates, and came back uh, to uh, Victoria. Um, abandoning them overseas. Uh, that's an overhead shot of uh, Hatley Estates, Hatley Park it's called now. Probably not uh, though, it was likely uh, that uh, he worked at Hatley Gardens in Victoria. Uh, where more than 100 groundskeepers, gardeners and laborers were on staff. Uh, in 1926, uh, the woman people are thinking of, her name would be Susan Carlos. She and Charlie met, probably it's unclear when exactly they met, but it was likely sometime in the, in the early 20s, probably 1924, uh, 1923 or 24. She became pregnant uh, before April of 1926. They married uh, in that year. Uh, they had their son, John Tubridge Abbott, uh, Abbott and he died, uh, tragically, six months after he was born. Uh, right after that, or nearly after that, that's a picture of Laura Dunsmere, uh, it's suspected that he lost his job. We don't, can't find firing records or anything like that, but uh, it's likely that he lost his job. We couldn't find any information for him working. Uh, often in the old directories, they listed people's occupation. There was no occupation listed for him. Uh, and Laura Dunsmere did have issues with alcohol and people who struggled with alcohol. Uh, and perhaps if he had been showing up to work drunk, uh, it's likely that he may have started drinking after, uh, after the loss of his child, uh, struggles with his wife continuing struggles with losing his family. Uh, and it may have been that she found it impossible to accept. 
just four years later, uh, after the death of their child, Charlie petitioned for divorce uh, with his wife, Susan, uh, in 1930. So they were divorced after that. But Charlie initiated that divorce. It's not clear why, um, just that he did. Charlie lost. We don't actually know much about what Charlie did, although we suspect. Uh, I talked to his family uh, and people that knew him. Uh, the belief was that after uh, he lost and divorced his wife, uh, he moved into the woods outside of Saanich. Uh, he did still have family in Victoria, uh, but particularly lived in the woods, emerging ever so often to reconnect with his family. Uh, but mostly spent that time uh, drinking. Uh, from time to time, uh, speaking with his niece, he would show up uh, soaking wet, often stinking of alcohol as well. Uh, obsessed with trains, he did ride the rails, um, drunk and without purpose, it said, not just on Vancouver Island, but on the mainland and down into the States. Uh, he worked as a longshoreman for a time uh, is rumored to have ridden the rails from BC to the US and back. Uh, there's one rumor that at uh, one time he had a 48 hour drunk up with Frank Sinatra. Uh, I don't know if I believe that, but it sure is interesting. Uh, but that was his life, was riding the trains uh, and then occasionally showing up at his family's house. Uh, and not for the better, uh, his family didn't really accept him in. They didn't, they tried to help him a little bit. Uh, they'd clean him up, let him have a shower when he showed up, uh, sent him to the Salvation Army in town. Uh, occasionally he would play uh, Snakes and Ladders, a game with which he was obsessed with his niece uh, and whoever won, uh, there'd be a nice shiny quarter waiting. Uh, at one point he brought a toy train, uh, quite an expensive one, uh, to his grandnephew. Um, now Charlie never had much, so the only thing he ever really cared, carried around was an old bicycle, a bicycle which uh, he still had in Shemanus. Well, he always had some form of bicycle that he rode uh, in Shemanus uh, and the clothes on his back. So he obviously didn't live extravagantly. Uh, he did have money though, uh, and in this case used it to buy uh, a train set for his uh, grandnephew. Uh, throughout the 40s, 50s, and 60s, he moved up and down the island. He stopped where he wanted, appearing every so often at his sister's house to collect his mail or catch a shower. Uh, at one point, he lived under a railway trestle in Duncan uh, and was beaten quite badly um, uh, by, a, uh, by a group of men. Uh, and after that, he left, uh, came north, uh, and uh, that's when he ended up in the woods uh, by St. Joseph's in Chaminas. Um, he was a boy soldier, uh, laborer, husband, father, and wanderer. He struggled with alcohol for most of his life, hiding from the demons that followed him along the railway. Uh, in Chaminas, he finally found his calling, not the man he'd been, but the man he'd become. He was always deeply religious, uh, he gave what little money he had to charity. Uh, stacks of mail would arrive at his brother's or sister's house in Victoria, uh, always thanking Charlie for his charitable donations. And on to the hermit, which is how we all know and remember Charlie. Uh, in Shemanus, Charlie adopted an ascetic and spiritual life. The woods became his church. Uh, he often spoke of being cast by God to build a temple, to find forgiveness for his past sins. Ironic, perhaps, that he'd done so next to the town's Catholic church. Uh, and he built this cathedral, this seven acre park uh, in which we could get to know him and ourselves. So he was famously short with his words, um, but big. Uh, in the world that he created for us all to live in. Uh, he lived in those woods for nearly 20 years, uh, each morning gathering an armload of switches for his handmade brooms, which he'd used to sweep the nearly seven acres of trails. He did that every day when he needed concrete. He would get on his bicycle, his old bicycle, 
and with his stooped over frame, he would ride to Duncan uh, and throw a 50 pound peg of concrete onto the basket of his bike and bring it back with him. Uh, but the work was never complete. If you ask Charlie when it would be done, he never had an answer. Uh, and it was never meant to be. Uh, it was meant uh, likely to be a place for all of us in Tremainus uh, to go. So no matter what we'd done or where we'd come from, we'd always have a place to be. In 1988, just one year before his passing, Charlie knew his days uh, in the trails were numbered and started preparing to move on. So there was an interview that came out the year before he passed uh, where there was a planned development in Shemanus, the uh, Pacific Artisan Village, uh, and there was a hotel planned for the area. Charlie saw that as the writing on the wall and didn't think he would stay for that. Um, some who knew him said he planned on going back to Victoria. Some tried to convince him to stay. Whatever he intended, his plans changed when he was diagnosed with lung cancer later that year. And this is just, Charlie was notoriously cryptic. And so you could see how, when people asked him how long he'd been there, uh, he would say things like, all I can say is I've been here ever since I came. You'll have to figure it out from there. Uh, or I was going to leave many times, but I'm still here. Uh, and that was just Charlie. He never talked about how he got there, or when he got there, uh, or when he was going to leave. He would just leave when it was time. Here's why today is such an important day. Charlie died in hospital on April 14th, 1989, 33 years ago today, surrounded by friends. Uh, Carl and Betty Schutz, the founders of modern Shemanus as a mural town, and Mavis Sheik, uh, Charlie's best friend, who used to make tomato soup and biscuits and leave them outside Charlie's makeshift woodland home. His last words, take them as you will, a final salvo fired at his brothers and sister. I outlasted them all. <laughs> the stories of the hermit suggest we don't know why he came to the woods in Shemanus. I argue that we know exactly why. It's in every step, every turn, and every path. This poem, which I'm going to read to you, uh, stood on a tree uh, near his home in the Hermit Trails. Uh, and it was always, it was the only thing written that stayed in the trail. And it stayed there until he died. On the pines along the trail, only a bird on lifted wing and vibrant in the forest hush the crystal chimes of silence ring. And when I walk beneath the pines, when the noonday sun so warmly shines, I laugh at the lore and pride of man and the sophist school and the learned clan. When man in woods with God may meet, alone with him amidst the mystic shadow, the solemn hush of nature newly born, alone with thee in solemn adoration, calm dew and freshness of the morn. Only the actions of the just smell sweet and blossom in the dust, and time proves all things. Thank you. I'm happy to take anyone's questions. So did you write that poem? I did not. No, I don't know who wrote it. Uh, we can't find who wrote it. It was just uh, written uh, beside his home. Yeah. Okay, just so our questions are on record, uh, somebody has to move around with the mic like Phil Donahue used to. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have any questions? Yes, um, I'm just curious about the, the park is near uh, the Catholic Church, and is, is there a name, and is it officially cared for by the city of Shemanus? It is not any, no, it's not cared for by anyone. So the land was originally owned by Macmillan Bloedel. Uh, they allowed Charlie to be on the land. Uh, at some point, there was some questionable paperwork about who owned the land, but that it was uh, supposed to be in trust for Charlie to maintain uh, and maintained as technically the Hermitage Park Trails, um, although that's not the name of it. Uh, then the uh, developers of the Pacific 
uh, Artisan Village purchased the land, including the land uh, that the Hermit Trails were on. Uh, and it has been somewhat contentious ever since. So their intention, they say, is to preserve the trails, although they are getting quite grown over. Uh, they're not being maintained. Occasionally, community groups do go in there and try and clean them up. But nobody has the dedication that Charlie does. And there's no money going into keeping them clean. Um, so nobody has taken up uh, the role of maintaining the trails at all. Uh, and they're not owned by anybody except uh, the developer. Uh, and strangely, the development was starting to happen when I still lived there, and there's nothing been developed there yet. So um, I don't know what that tells you, but uh, it ain't good. <laughs> the big gate in Argerson. That's the big gate, and yeah, but there's still nothing there, and there's been nothing there for 40 years. So I'm curious, is his, is his home still there? No. Or so do they know the location of it? Well, I do know the location okay. of it. Uh, I don't have it in here. But the home, uh, the year before he died, or maybe it was a year and a half before he died, basically, he lived in a place that was smaller than two of these tables put together. So it was literally just like a shack, barely big enough for a cot. Uh, it was quite literally falling apart. Uh, so I, about a year and a half before he died, they tore that shack down and put a little trailer in for him. Um, so Carl and Betty and a bunch of people pitched in and bought him a small little, you know, those little like round teardrop things. So they got him a little thing like that or a little camper uh, to sleep in. Um, and so no, that's not standing any longer. And you mentioned someone who brought him soup and things. Were there other people who supported him in Shemena? Like how, how Very he, rarely, like I think people kind of knew he was there. He didn't, I mean, that was part of it, was he didn't really crave company. So the people that got to know him worked really hard at it. And even then, it's not like, you know, there were no deep conversations. I think Mavis just did it you know, because she had a really kind spirit. Often, I, I mean, I lived right across the street. I was probably in those trails every day. And I didn't see him every day. Um, so, you know, you'd go weeks without seeing him at all. And then you'd see him in passing. And we didn't actually know his name was Charlie at the time. Everyone just called him the hermit. Um, so nobody knew what his name was. Uh, this was before the murals and all that stuff. Um, so we just kind of, yeah, I mean, and as a kid, like this, you know, this stooped over uh, old gentleman in a gray suit that was notoriously like, yeah, he was a hermit, but he was kind of curmudgeonly. Uh, so he wasn't like, hello, children. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think uh, probably kids mostly avoided him. Uh, and people just kind of let him, uh, left him alone. Yeah. They thought he wanted to be alone, so they just let him do that. Thank you. Uh, but other people may have taken him stuff. Uh, certainly the nuns from the Catholic Church uh, did know him and did uh, at times take him stuff, but uh, none of them were available to talk to. I remember Mavis saying she'd bring him baking. He'd accept it. But sometimes you just say, accept and say, go away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Since his reception of people was mixed. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Or even of her. Of everybody, yeah. Uh, yeah, question here. Um, so I'm fairly new to the area. Okay. Uh, so I don't know where this Catholic church is and where these trails are you're talking about. In Shamanus, do you know where in Shamanus? I don't know where in Shamanus. Uh, if you're driving down Old Shamanus Road, uh, there's, as you're driving on the right, you'll see like this really ostentatious giant pink arch on the right, kind of up around the corner. Uh, so there's a little road that goes up, and then up on a hill, there's this mat. It, I mean, it's huge. You can't miss it. It's like 30 feet tall. If you just go up there, and kind of curve around to the right. Uh, the church is up at the top of the hill. The entrance to Charlie's Trail. Oh, you're going to make me do this. I haven't been there in a while. To get to Charlie's Trail, you have to stay right 
follow around the baseball fields. Everyone's going to remember this, right? You have to stay right, follow around the fences of the baseball fields, and eventually you'll kind of come to a dead end, and you'll see like a little, you know, those cedar, uh, it's like a cedar fence, so it, but it's the big cedar, and it kind of does the zigzag thing. You'll see some of those, and that's the entrance to the trail. So it's off the main road, then? Yeah. You go off the main road? Yeah, you go off Old Shemina's Road. But you have to go right into Shemina's to get there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, I, have, I, I shop at the health food store. Oh, okay, yeah. So it's right off of Old Shemina's Road, but on the right. So don't go into town, into downtown. Just stay on Old Shemina's Road if you're driving south, and then it's to the right. And it's up the hill by St. Paul's Church? St. Joseph's. St. Joseph's. You bet. But on like the other side, so St. Joseph's is to the left, the Hermit Trail is to the right. Is the school yeah. actually closer, you think? No. No? No, the school is right next to the church. Mm -hmm. you have a question from the board here? I can pull up a satellite shot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just a quick comment about the boy soldiers. In the Canadian Expeditionary Force, uh, to start with, there was no age requirement until 1917. Interesting. Wow. So there were a number of people that were sent back in 1917, including a, a boy soldier about that tall from the Nile. Woof. Yeah. Google Maps on that. Just the sure try. Yeah. So could you talk about the trails? Did he create the trails? He did. He carved them out of nothing. So there was nothing there, just woods. Uh, and he carved them. Um, I can actually pull up some photos of the Hermit Trail here. No? No, I can't. Well. I mean, you can perhaps get, it's not much of a sense. Um, but I can tell you where, I mean, this is right at the entrance to the trail. So as you go into the trail, this is some of the best work that he did. Uh, and this would be right at the entrance. And then there's uh, lots of this stonework all around the beginning, all this sort of stonework bordering the edges of the trail. Uh, there were parts where he, uh, carved some long banisters to go down to the river. I think those are largely gone now. Uh, some of the places where he would have carved steps to move up and down between the creek uh, and the upper trail, a lot of that's grown over, dangerous now. So this is really, if you go into the trail, as you go into it, this is mostly what you're gonna see now. It was much more extensive than this, but a lot of it has either, it's been lost to storm or neglect or uh, been knocked down or vandalized uh, since. Um, because, yeah, I mean, it's 30, 33 years he's been gone and nobody's maintained it. I think they did for a couple of weeks after he was gone. But this is all held up quite well uh, and there's some trees bordered around the area uh, that you can still see. But this is probably the best uh, the best thing to see while you were in the trail. And then the trail still exists. Uh, and there's little benches still throughout, um, but it's not nearly as beautiful as it was. Was he, con was he considered a nuisance? Like, for example, would your parents, when you were a young boy, would they say, look out for him, or? No. No, I mean, I don't know if that was just the sign of the time, but I think, well, I was a latchkey kid, so they were frequently working anyway. Uh, and they were happy to let me go and run amok in the bushes. Uh, so we were, my house was bordered by woods on both the back and the other side. Uh, as long as I was doing that, I wasn't getting into, I wasn't watching TV or doing <laughs> something bad. Uh, so they were quite happy to let me run amok. Yeah. Uh, and everybody, I mean, Shemias is a very small town. It's small still today, but it was much smaller in the 70s and 80s. I think it definitely spiked during the summer, but probably during the winter and off season, there was maybe, you know, maybe a thousand people in the whole of the town. Everybody knew everybody, so you didn't worry too much.
Yes, Shauna. Um, do you have a plan to do something with your research? Like I, I didn't, I don't know if you've already talked about this or not, but um, is there an interest in in Charlie and uh, and in um, developing the story or developing a an access to the trail or anything like that? Um, I don't know. Let's see. I mean, this is again. I haven't really done much with the story uh, until now. I didn't. You know, after Daryl contacted me and asked me to do it, I thought this would be a good place to try it and see what the interest was and if people, how people felt about the story. And we'll put it online after this and see, you know, if people are continue to be interested in it. And I'm always interested in turning things into stories, but uh, also I gotta, I gotta pay rent. So if someone <laughs> wants to give me an advance to write a book, uh, I would happily turn it into something like that. Uh, at this point, I'm happy to keep doing this presentation and uh, maybe try and answer some unanswered questions. Uh, it would be great if uh, the city of Chimaeus or the town of Chimaeus took it on to revitalize the trail. Uh, I don't know if that's in the cards or not, but I'm always interested to see if these things can catalyze action. Have you thought of making it a play and then maybe that could be monetized? Oh, sure. <laughs> after I get through the after I get through the nine that I've already written, I'll put this one on my list next. Maybe they'll produce it at the Shaminas Theater. There you go, that's true. Brother twelve into it. What's that? And Brother 12. Well, yeah, that musical did very well. Yeah. So <laughs> maybe if I make it a musical. Yeah. <laughs> now, I remember um, being told that he went into the hospital twice a week for a bath. And when he went through town for anything at all, was he given a wide berth? Or was he, did people try to approach him? And He was more of a fixture, really. I mean, he didn't walk through town. I don't know that I ever really recall seeing him walk through town. He was always on his bicycle. It's possible people tried to approach him. Um, but again, like he wasn't into it, you know? Mm -hmm. So if anybody did, I'm sure if that was Mavis's experience, uh, I, I can't imagine what anyone else's would be. And I spoke to my dad, and my dad said he would go and talk from talk to him from time to time. And um, but I, I think everybody really just respected that he wanted to be alone, mm. and it was just known in the town that he was there in the trails, uh, doing his thing. That the work wasn't to be there. He wasn't interested in being recognized for the work. He wasn't interested in being rewarded for the work. That's not why he was doing it. Um, so people did talk to him when they were in the trails or when they saw him. I don't think anyone went out of their way uh, to interact with him because he just wanted to be left alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, yeah, he always said God commissioned him. Or God yeah. spoke to him. Well, and, and even at the end, I mean, you, <laughs> the sort of things he says, You know, and in the in the last, you know, I thought I was going to leave. This, so there's this whole piece in the in the newspaper in the I think it was in the Citizen, uh, the the Shemina Citizen, uh, in '88 uh, or possibly '89. Might have been from this article. The whole thing. He's basically the tone is that I don't I'm done with this place. Like <laughs> I don't want to be here anymore. I don't like this anymore. All you people coming and bothering me. I mean, he was really kind of grumpy about it. And even working on the trails, yes, it was a labor. I don't know that it was a labor of love. Like, he always felt, like, if you asked him about it, he wasn't, he didn't regale you with stories of the beautiful work he'd done. He didn't, he didn't talk about it. It was, a, it was work that he was called to. It wasn't, and it was, again, you know, it was work he was called to, forgiveness of his past sins. I don't think he felt like he had a choice to do anything except what he was doing there. Mm -hmm. it's atonement. I mean, I'm reaching by saying that, like nobody knows that for sure, but it seems like that was the case. He never sought anything for doing it, never asked for money, never asked for help. Um, 
that was his atonement. That was the work he had been called to do by God. And that was it. He didn't talk about it to anybody else. Um, and when the work was done, he was done with it. So I think towards the end, you know, in that last article, the, the way he was talking was that he felt like he was being released from the work. And he could go and, and move on and maybe try and go back home or something. So what did he do for money? Like he wasn't making money. What did he do for money? Well, he had, uh, he had pension checks. He had uh, CPP and stuff like that. So he kept enough to eat very modestly uh, and gave the rest to charity. But yeah, he had a modest pension and no overhead. <laughs> I find it interesting that I used to work at least a day a week in Shumanus, and then I had my office in Shumanus for oh, probably two and a half years, and tonight is the first time I've ever heard of Charlie. Wow. When were you there? Late 70s and up through the 80s. Okay. Well, that was, I mean, that was prime Charlie time. Yeah. yeah. Well, now you know. Yeah. <laughs> I wish my dad had made it here. He was coming, and I don't know if he got mixed up with Bevan Park instead of Bowen Park. But he had known him, but the man didn't talk very often. But my dad had offered him some like daffodil bulbs and snowdrops or something, and he quite gladly took them and, and that. So he remembers that. Yeah. My dad's 89. Yeah, he didn't make it here. I know. Uh, I one other Charlie quote I remember is him saying, I don't have any family, and if you find any of them, I don't want anything to do with them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that was, uh, and when I spoke to, uh, it wasn't his sister I spoke to, it was his, uh, his niece. Um, but when I spoke to her, she, I mean, when she remembered him, he wasn't. She had those little memories of him playing games and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, their family did not have a good relationship. All right. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Going. Going. Gone. Okay. Well, thank you all so much. It was really wonderful to be here. On, on behalf of the society and, and our visitors tonight, I'd like to thank you for your, your presentation. And it was, um, as you say, quite fittingly, it was on the, the 33rd anniversary of his passing. And as, as, as you were talking about Charlie, it kind of reminded me, some of you might, uh, any Can Lip fans here, of uh, W.O. Mitchell, and uh, Who Has Seen the Wind, and the character in the, in the small town, uh, if I remember correctly, he lived in a piano box. <laughs> and you, when you were talking about Charlie, I don't know why this. Uh, I mean, this is long ago from you know English lit or Canadian lit course, and yeah. suddenly this W. L. Mitchell popped into my mind, and this in the same very similar hermit character in a small wow. Saskatchewan town. Um, wow. But he 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 would talk to people. That's amazing. And just so you all, this wasn't planned. Like we didn't, neither Daryl nor I didn't remember that this was the anniversary of his death. This was just one of the days that Daryl offered me. This was a complete accident. I recognized it yesterday when I was finishing the presentation. I was like, huh, that's kind of weird. Uh, so yeah, faded for today. And, and delightful. You have to wonder one, what would Charlie say? All these people talking about him and speculating. <laughs> He no. would probably flip this table over. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, on, on behalf of the Society and Charlie, well, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. thank you. Thank you for joining us, ladies and gentlemen. If you'd like to stay, we have some refreshments in the back for I guess, tea and snacks and that. So um, look forward to chatting with you. Thank you.